Good afternoon. Welcome to today's press conference. I'm just going to go over some ground rules. The conference will begin in just a few moments. Please turn off all of your cell phones, pagers, and radios. Do not for any reason approach the podium or the stage. No devices will be placed on the podium. Only the first two rows are available for questions to the speaker. No photographs may be taken from the right and left of the auditorium and do not cross the center aisle in front of the cameras. Once the conference has started, do not exit the room because you will not be allowed to re-enter after that point. And finally, at the conclusion of the conference, only use the door to my right as an exit. Thank you.
Good morning, General. This is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Can you hear me? General, this is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Can you hear me? Yes, Brian. Loud and clear. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. And uh, thank you for taking the time today to be with us. And I'd like to welcome the, the Pentagon Press Corps uh, this morning and uh, thank them for coming in uh, at an, an unusually early time for uh, perhaps our operations. Um, most of you probably know our briefer today, who is U.S. Army Major General John Batiste. He's the commander of the Multinational Division North Central uh, and also the commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, general Batiste and his division are responsible for the ongoing security operations in North Central Iraq. And uh, he's here today to talk about uh, what his uh, division has been doing. Uh, and uh, he has a few uh, comments that he would like to make. And then we'll start with some questions uh, from the Pentagon and go back to uh, Baghdad for the press that are uh, in the room there. And uh, we'll uh, keep this to about 30 minutes. General Batiste cannot see us here in the Pentagon. So when you uh, ask questions, if you could just identify yourself, that would uh, help him, as he knows some of you out there, I'm sure. General? Thank you, Brian. And good, good afternoon or morning in the case of the Pentagon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Task Force Danger in the 1st Infantry Division Combat Team as Brian said, is operating in north central Iraq in the four provinces of Saliadin, Diyala, Kirkuk, and Suleimaniya. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about the great work of Iraq's security forces in north central Iraq and our combined efforts to prepare for the 30 January elections. After I take a few moments to address recent activities of the Iraqi security forces and preparations for the elections, I'd be glad to take your questions. I'll begin by saying that on the 6th of January, Iraqi Army Day, was a quite significant day in north central Iraq. Army Day, the celebration of the founding of Iraq's army in 1921, marked the merging of the Iraqi National Guard and the Iraqi Army. Along with eight other Iraqi Army divisions, the day marked the activation of the Iraqi 4th Division. The 4th Division consists of four brigades and 18 battalions to include three recently activated oil security battalions. The division is commanded by Lieutenant General Abdul Aziz, a man of courage and conviction, who is dedicated to freedom, an integrated society, and the value of every human being. Battalions are garrisoned throughout the four provinces of North Central Iraq and are partnered with the battalions of Task Force Danger. The results are remarkable and speak for themselves. Perhaps most importantly, the Iraqi 4th Division represents what is and what is meant to be in Iraq. The soldiers of the division not only f reflect the rich ethnic religious diversity of Iraq, but they also imbue with the energy, courage, and determination which the vast majority of the Iraqi people have for freedom and representative government. They, they love their country, and they consider themselves to be Iraqis first. And like the United States military, which was the institution that integrated America, the Iraqi army will do the same for the people of Iraq. The division has adopted a fitting motto, unity is strength. Here you see Iraqi drill instructors, not American, training a group of motivated Iraqi soldiers at a training center in Tikrit. The same thing is happening every day in training centers in Kirkuk, Bakuba, and Suleimaniya. It is easy to see the pride and commitment of these great soldiers as they complete their challenging basic training. We see no shortage or, or committed of committed Iraqis willing to serve their country. The strength of the Iraqi security forces lies not only in ideals and mottos, but is demonstrated every day by the actions of these brave men and women. To cite just a few of the many examples of the proficiency of the Iraqi security forces in north central Iraq, I'll start with the 205th Iraqi Army Battalion in the province of Diyala. During an independently planned and executed cordon and search in Muqtadiyah on January 4th, the 205th Battalion captured the six insurgents you see here. On January 7th, after receiving intelligence tips from local citizens, Iraqi soldiers independently conducted a follow-on clearing operation. After a fierce six-hour engagement, the 205th detained more than 70 insurgents, IED-making material, and a large cache of weapons. 
Following the operation, the Iraqi media reported that security forces are trained and committed to serve and protect anytime, anywhere. In the Saladin province, the 203rd Iraqi Army Battalion has been very aggressive in carrying out its mission. Alpha Company of the 203rd has been conducting independent operations to disrupt insurgent activity prior to the elections. In the first 12 days of January, this great company captured 16 caches of weapons and munitions, and in conjunction with their coalition partners, 77 ins insurgents were detained during the same period. In Samara, the 7th Iraqi Army Battalion, the 2nd Special Police Battalion, and the 202nd Army Iraqi Army Battalion have seized 86 caches since October when the Iraqi security and coalition forces launched Operation Baton Rouge to successfully rid the city of insurgents. The 2nd Special Police Battalion has also conducted 204 deliberate raids in Samara during the same period. To the north, Iraqi security forces in the Kirkuk province have been impressive. Last night, the Kirkuk Emergency Services Unit part of the city's police force and the 207th Iraqi Army Battalion executed raids on eight objectives in order to prevent insurgent attacks prior to elections. Four high payoff targets and a total of 31 insurgents were detained. Recently, a police academy was stood up in the Suleimaniya province to train up to 1,000 police recruits at a time. The academy trains classes which reflect the ethnic diversity of the region. Coached by international police advisors, Shia and Sunni Arab, as well as Kurdish, Assyrian, and Turkmen police recruits from north central Iraq come together for an eight-week training program of instruction. Although fielding police forces has proven to be a challenge, graduates of this program and others like it in Jordan and Baghdad consistently stand their ground and defeat the insurgents. As is true with the Iraqi army, Iraqi police officers perform superbly when properly trained, equipped, and led. The key is finding the right leaders and we have done just that in the towns and cities in our area of operations. The Suleimaniya Academy is producing competent and well-led police. Across the street, patrolmen from the Department of Border Enforcement are also trained to properly secure the border between Iran and Iraq in our region. The Department of Border Enforcement forces in both the Suleimaniya and Diyala provinces have made remarkable progress with respect to training and equipping and are performing well. On a recent trip to a snow-covered crossing site on the Iran-Iraq border, I saw firsthand the professionalism and dedication of these great officers. Indeed, a prosperous and democratic Iraq rests with the country's ability to maintain a safe and secure environment, and it's a team effort. Here you see Iraqi security forces working with independent electoral commission of Iraq officials, provincial civilian leadership, directors of joint coordination centers, Iraqi security forces, and task force danger soldiers to set the conditions for Iraq's historic elections on the 30th of January. Throughout north central Iraq, these leaders have come together in provincial and municipal joint coordination centers to plan and synchronize their efforts to ensure successful elections. From the distribution of ballots and elections materials to the security of over 1,000 polling sites to rehearsing well-developed security plans, these teams have left no stone unturned. This election will be an election for Iraqis, run by Iraqis. The bottom line is North Central Iraq is ready for elections. Like all military and police forces fighting against the evils of terror around the world, the Iraqi security forces have been tested by the loss of their fellow soldiers and policemen. On January 3rd, the 203rd Iraqi Army Battalion lost 21 brave soldiers when a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device detonated beside their bus. And on January 11th, the Tikrit police force lost six police by another vehicle-borne improvised explosive device attack. Here you see members of the 203rd Iraqi Army Battalion conducting a memorial service which followed the January 3rd attack, which I just mentioned. Like other soldiers and police officers around the world, the Iraqi security forces have honored their fallen comrades and then carried on their mission with renewed resolve and determination. This resolve and determination has enabled the Iraqi army and police, either acting independently or in concert with coalition forces, to detain 1,371 insurgents, kill 170 insurgents, 
and wound another 36 insurgents in north central Iraq since October 1st of 2004. In closing, my message to you today is that Iraq's security forces are steadily pr progressing. Every day, the Iraqi Army, Police, and Department of Border Enforcement demonstrate their ability to carry out their mission while relying less and less on their coalition partners. Together with civic, tribal, and religious leaders, the Iraqi security forces have achieved irreversible momentum towards prosperity and representative government. Based on the competencies of the Iraqi team, I am confident in the future of Iraq. We are right where we need to be in this important mission. And thank you. At this point, I'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, General. We'll start over here. General Batiste, Barbara Starr from CNN. Um, can you sketch out for us on Election Day in your area, and even if you can discuss it more broadly across Iraq, the role that the security role that U.S. forces will play the security role that Iraqi forces will play. Who will do what? Barbara, as I said in my opening statement, this is an election uh, for Iraqis by Iraqis. I have been very impressed uh, in the past couple of months with the incredible teamwork between the IECI directors in each province, the provincial governors and their deputy governors, the Iraqi security force leaders within each province, that is the Iraqi army brigade commanders and the provincial police chiefs, uh, and the directors of the provincial joint coordination centers as they come together to work through the details of the security plan for election day. They've done this in all four of our province to exacting detail. They know exactly where the polling stations are, and they've developed the plans to secure them. Not only that, they've worked hard uh, to rehearse the plans at the provincial level, at the city level, uh, right down to the police station level. Uh, all of this is going on every day. In the next seven to 10 days, I'll be attending personally the final provision, pr provincial election uh, rehearsals in each one of the provinces. The, the job of the 1st Infantry Division Combat Team is to facilitate this, to set the Iraqi security forces up for success. Uh, and we'll do just that. Does that answer your question? Um, apologies, but no, sir, it really doesn't. What will the role of, what will the mission be? What will U.S. forces do in your area on Election Day? Will we see them visible? Will they be on the street? Will they be working? hand in hand visibly with Iraqi security forces? Will they hold back in a less visible role? What will they do? Who will secure the polling places? Well, let me spec step back in time a bit to answer your question. And the answer really started weeks ago. It's all about taking the fight to the enemy. It's all about taking the fight to the insurgent with intelligence-driven, uh, deliberate combat operations to kill or capture the insurgent. We've been doing that in the 1st Infantry Division Combat Team and Task Force Danger, as, as has the rest of the Corps, for a very long time. These operations go on continually, day and night. As I speak, there are three deliberate operations ongoing within Task Force Danger to the north. There'll be more operations tomorrow, relentless operations, chasing down the insurgent, taking away his initiative and disrupting what he's trying to do. That will go on continuously up through to and after the elections. Meanwhile, as I described, we're working with the Iraqi security forces uh, to assist them to develop plans for election security that will work. You'll see Iraqi security forces at the polling stations. You'll see Iraqi security forces in the polling stations and around the polling stations securing every one of them. The 1st Infantry Division soldiers will support, will, op will operate uh, from a distance, it will provide quick reaction forces as needed, and uh, will do whatever is necessary to ensure that this is an, an effective, uh, safe, and secure election. Carl? General, it's Carl Rochelle with NBC News. A couple of questions. First one, uh, this almost constant uh, IEDs, VBIDs, uh, suicide bombers, how is that affecting your ability to recruit Iraqis for your training purposes? And how is that affecting the morale of uh, trying to get them trained up and out on the streets and carry out their mission? Carl, that's a good question. We have great Iraqi security forces in north central Iraq. 
As I described, we've got 18 battalions of Iraqi army, any number of police stations uh, with good policemen, getting better every day. We've had 45 uh, suicide vehicle-borne IEDs uh, detonate within AO danger. That's the 1st Infantry Division's area of responsibility since we assumed the mission 11 months ago. And 42 vehicle concealed IEDs, that is a car loaded with explosives without a driver uh, that's, that's remotely detonated. Uh, lately, these IEDs, these vehicle-borne IEDs, have been targeting the Iraqi security forces. And as I described in my opening statement, they have killed some number of brave Iraqis. The incredible thing is, though, that these soldiers, these great soldiers in the battalions in the four brigades of the 4th Division, are undeterred. Their resolve is incredible. And I know that because I spend a lot of time with them. We have partnered the, the battalions of the 4th Division with the battalions of the 1st Infantry Division. And we've been doing that for the past 11 months. And the partnership that has developed, the training, uh, the rapport, and the understanding between the Iraqi and the American uh, battalions is quite phenomenal. We have no problem filling the ranks of the Iraqi army or the Iraqi police. There is no shortage of brave uh, Iraqis that want to stand up for their country. It's phenomenal. Second question. Um, we keep hearing reports that Abu Musab al-Zarqawi is in northern Iraq somewhere and is behind most of these suicide missions, kidnappings, and what have you. Do you get any intel at all that he is in that area and what's being done to try to capture him? Carl, we, we continuously press the insurgent with intel-driven combat operations, day and night, aggressive, to take the fight to him, very successfully. And we certainly are chasing Zarqawi and his associates and Al-Qaeda and anybody else who wants to stop the process uh, within Iraq. Right. Yeah. Hi, uh, General Brian Hartman with uh, ABC News. Two questions. First, can you give us an idea of the security environment in your area right now, how many attacks you're having on U.S. and Iraqi forces? And then second, how big of a problem is intimidation? Uh, family members, the uh, Iraqi security forces themselves, contractors, how, how big of a problem in your area is, is intimidation of the Iraqis who are working with you? Well, the number of attacks in, in the 1st Infantry Division Combat Team's area of operation uh, ebbs and flows, but yesterday it was about 24 attacks. That is uh, 24 a combination of direct fire attacks, indirect fire attacks, and IEDs. Uh, they're placed along the side of the road or a vehicle-borne IED. Generally, that, out of that number, about 25 percent is directed against the Iraqi security forces. That number is going up in our area of operation. And we attribute that to the fact that the Iraqi security forces are getting better and better every day, better trained and better equipped. We have pumped $32 million of equipment into the Iraqi security forces uh, that we are partnered with uh, up in AO danger since we got into this mission 11 months ago. A huge amount of equipment that continues to flow to these brave soldiers and policemen. Uh, Gerald, and the second part of the question was, uh, how big of a problem, how, how much intimidation are these uh, Iraqi soldiers, National Guardsmen, police that show up for work, how much intimidation are they, their families, uh, those of contractors who work with you, how big of a problem is that in your area? There's a fair amount of intimidation, uh, uh, no doubt about it. That's one of the tactics of this insurgent uh, who has no values, who cares not how he kills, uh, and it has an impact, but again, the resolve of the Iraqi people that I know in the four provinces of north central Iraq, whether they're Kurd or Sunni Arab or Shia Arab or Turkmen or Assyrian, is incredible. The vast majority of these people want freedom and they want representative government and they're willing to fight for it. It takes my breath away. The small number that are doing this, intimidating the good people of Iraq, are getting desperate and they will not be successful. General, we have Several more questions back here, but uh, we don't want to monopolize it from the Pentagon. Perhaps uh, you'd want to ask a couple of questions, two or three questions of reporters in the room there, and then throw it back to us. Okay, we'll do that. Let's take this question right here. 
Thank you, General. Colin McMahon from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, two questions, one specific uh, about Samara. How many U.S. forces are deployed there now? And the other one is General Metz about uh, a week ago talked about four provinces in which it would be very difficult to have elections today. One of those was Salahuddin, um, Diallo to a lesser extent. Uh, how does that square with the, with the portrait you've uh, given us today? Tom, two, two great questions. Let me start with Samara. Going back in time, you'll recall that uh, coalition and Iraqi forces attacked on the, the 1st of October based on a decision by Prime Minister Alawi uh, to rid Samara of insurgents. And, and that's exactly what the division combat team, particularly the 2nd Brigade combat team of the 1st Infantry Division did. Uh, very effective operation that it lasted a couple of days, very precise. Uh, killed a good number of insurgents. Uh, and since then, we have moved into the phase of the operation where we are attempting and working hard to change attitudes and give the good people of Samara an alternative to the insurgency. Part of the, the, the challenge in Samara, and we're facing it head on, is to rebuild the police force. In the past, the Samara police force was poorly led, uh, corrupt, not respected by the people of Samara. In fact, that police force uh, was working with the insurgency, and under pressure, they quit. Uh, so. Before we conducted the operation on the 1st of October to, to, to free the city, we set the conditions to rebuild the police force. We set the conditions to begin the repair of infrastructure to improve the quality of life of the people, uh, to set the conditions to prepare for the phases after combat operations. We're right now deep into the process, uh, and this is a long answer to get to your question, we're deep into the process to build that police force. We have a, a, a police uh, uh, commander now, the chief of police in Samara, has been identified. Uh, he's a good man. He's been approved by the Iraqi Minister of the Interior. We have 350 police recruits currently in training in Jordan and Baghdad. And our intent is to bring those police recruits back, start the next rotation of trainees, but we're going to bring them back and, and train them more with the inter international police advisors that support the 1st Infantry Division uh, and develop a cohort, if you will, of a great police force properly equipped before we introduce them back into the city. Meanwhile, back in Samara, uh, the government of Iraq has given, uh, committed four battalions into the effort to secure that city. And they're doing a great job, as, as I showed you in my opening comment. Uh, they have identified 186 caches of weapons and munitions, significant. Uh, they have conducted 204 deliberate raids that are very good. No surprise that the Iraqi Special Police Battalion uh, knows exactly where to go and where to follow up on an operation. But at the moment, we have four of these great formations. We have the 2nd Special Police Battalion. We have the 7th Iraqi Army Battalion. We have the 3rd Public Order Battalion. And of course, the 202 Iraqi Army Battalion that's partnered with the battalion from the 1st Infantry Division in Samara. On top of that, we have four U.S. companies of infantry permanently garrisoned in Samara. We do all of this to ensure that that city is, is secure and that the insurgency is not allowed to regain a foothold. And this insurgency, let there be no doubt, is attempting to do that. But they will not be successful. They will not be successful because of the resolve of the interim Iraqi government, the Iraqi security forces, a police force that we are in the process of rebuilding that will be competent, well-led, well-equipped. Now, what was your second part of that? Sir, it was regarding General Metz's comments and that the four of the 18 provinces would be ill-prepared to hold elections. We have been working uh, hard for several months now in each of the four provinces of north-central Iraq as I described in the opening statement, with the Independent Electoral Commission of Iraq, director in each province, the provincial leadership in each province, the Iraqi Security Force leadership in each province, and the Provincial Joint Coordination Center director in each province to work this planning, to pull it all together, to identify polling stations. We know exactly where they are. We understand the plan to secure each of them uh, with Iraqi security forces. We understand the plan to employ the 1st Infantry Division combat team in support of the Iraqi security forces. All of that's coming together well. We, we will succeed in all four of our provinces. 
General Metz is correct. In Samara and Beji, we are still working through some problems. There are still problems in Samara. Uh, make there, there, there's no doubt that there'll be elections in Samara. We will set the conditions and the polling stations will be there. Uh, in Beji, there's another problem set. That's the crossroads for holy insurgents heading from Mosul to, to Baghdad and from Fallujah to Kirkuk. And we are still in the process of developing and, and setting the conditions for successful elections in Beji. Uh, in Diyala province, Bakuba, things are going very well. Very well. I see no problems there. Next question. Um, Steve Negus, Financial Times. Um, we, actually, in specific regard to Diyala province, there, there were four additional governorates to the four where there's quite a few attacks, which are marginal. I believe there's between, uh, said to be between one and three attacks per day. Uh, we, we had guessed that Diyala and Kirkuk were possibly two of those provinces. Can you say anything about the number of attacks in those two provinces and um, about the, yeah, the threat through the election there? Uh, yes, Steve. Diyala and Kirkuk actually uh, do not have the majority of attacks that we experience on any given day. Diyala has a, a tremendous Iraqi uh, army brigade. The, the 32nd Brigade down in, in, uh, in Diyala is well led, and, and the four battalions of that outfit, 205th Iraqi Army Battalion that I explained in my opening statement, uh, is outstanding. They go after the enemy day in and day out. They do it without coalition assistance. They're well led well-trained and well-equipped. And it's outfits like that that are setting the conditions. The police in, in Bakuba, aggressive. The Diala governor, dedicated, committed to his people, a very brave man. Uh, I'm not worried about the Diala province. Moving to Kirkuk, another great province with a whole different set of problems, a whole different set of dynamics, as you all are well aware. They have the best police department uh, that I've seen. Uh, they also have a great Iraqi National Guard Brigade, the 31st Brigade, commanded by Brigadier General Anwar. Great battalions, and as I described, he has now picked up three oil security battalions to help him secure the oil infrastructure from Kirkuk to Beji. And I know he'll do a great job. We're working with General Petraeus to get him the guns and the ammunition that he needs, and all of that is working as we speak. Trucks are moving. We're going to stop that interdiction of the oil infrastructure. The Iraqis are going to stop it. And I, I'm very confident in that. The, the Kirkuk province has done a tremendous job in preparing for the elections. The teamwork up there is phenomenal. Again, the polling stations are well known. The process has been rehearsed. And, and I know that it'll go well. Yes, right here. Uh, General Rod Nordlin from Newsweek. Um, a lot of Sunnis particularly complain that the military, the security forces in Iraq are becoming predominantly Kurdish and Shia. Um, could you comment on just the degree to which that's true in your area? And, and if, not, if it's not true, how much of a problem that perception is that's widely held? I agree that the perception would be a problem. The reality within the north center north central four provinces of Iraq is that there's a good mix, a very good mix. The division commander uh, is absolutely committed to an integrated Iraq. This is a, a very capable general who spent many years in the army. He was an armor officer. He was wounded six times. He was in 22 campaigns. Uh, he ended up his career as a commandant of the War College. He knows every single lieutenant colonel and colonel from the previous Iraqi army and, and, and can absolutely uh, rate the, cal the uh, capabilities uh, of each of those officers. But he's dedicated to an integrated Iraq. It matters not to him whether a soldier is Kurd or Arab or Turkmen or Assyrian. In the four provinces, in, in the four brigades, there's a, there's a pretty good mix. I mean, clearly in Salih ad -Din, it's primarily Sunni. In the, and that would be the 30th Brigade. The 32nd Brigade in Diyala is mixed. Uh, the 31st Brigade in Kirkuk is mixed, as it should be. The Brigade in Suleimania, no surprise, is, is Kurd. Uh, but no, I, I don't see a, a, a Shia uh, majority in any of these brigades that I uh, am partnered with.
Is that General Aziz you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Is he Kurdish or? Yeah, as a matter of fact, he is. Yes. Here. Thank you, General. Steve Fainry with the Washington Post. Uh, you mentioned that the um, the that the U.S. forces will be will be maintaining a distance on on Election Day, and will be providing quick response. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that strategy and why U.S. forces are not playing a more direct role in protection of polling places. Steve, it's important that, that this election be an Iraqi election for Iraqis by Iraqis. It's important that the 43,000 Iraqi security forces in my area, 43,000 soldiers in the Iraqi army, uh, a combination of soldiers in the Iraqi army, police, and Department of Border Enforcement, are, are in charge, in control, uh, conducting operations uh, to secure those four provinces. We will certainly support them, but the infrastructure that they have developed with joint coordination centers in each province, with joint coordination centers in 21 of the cities, to tie it all together, to synchronize their efforts, to command and control the operations on the 30th of January is very, very good. My 25,000 soldiers, and by the way, that includes an extra brigade and twice the helicopters that, that I had a month ago will be in full support. We, we will be working with our Iraqi security force partners to make sure that, that what they're doing makes sense, that, to make sure that if they need help, we are there to mentor and advise, and as I said earlier, to provide the quick reaction forces that will be necessary to stomp on the insurgent when he raises his ugly head. We could take a couple more from back here. More from back here. Well, just a second. One more here. Thanks a lot, General. Uh, Ashraf Khalil from the LA Times. Um, I, you mentioned earlier the, the, a specific set of dynamics and a specific set of issues around Kirkuk. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that, not only for the national election, but for the provincial election. There's been yeah. a lot of pressure for a delay to the Kirkuk provincial election from some of the Kurdish parties. You're right. There has been pressure to delay the provincial elections, and, and that, quite frankly, is a decision that needs to be taken uh, by the interim Iraqi government, by the sovereign government of Iraq, in consultation with the Independent Election Committee of Iraq. And I just as soon leave it at that. Uh, I the difficulties primarily have to do with, with resettlement, with the resettlement of, of, of the, the, the peoples, all ethnicities, by the way, that Saddam Hussein wronged terribly with his Arab, Arabization process. And there's no doubt that, that we are committed uh, to a Kirkuk for all Iraqis. There's no doubt that we are also committed to, to, to right the wrongs of Saddam Hussein. And it's all spelled out in the, in the towel, in the transitional administrative law, uh, fully supported by the interim Iraqi government. Uh, there's a deliberate process. Uh, there's the Iraqi Property Claims Commission that is up and running and, and doing their business. There are 18,000 claims right now filed. Uh, within the four provinces of, of, of North Central Iraq at local Iraqi Property Claims Commission offices. And the good news is that 76 of these claims have now been adjudicated. So the momentum is going in the right direction. I saw this in Bosnia, in Srebrenica, and these kinds of issues are not solved in one year. They take time, they take patience, and they take a process, which we have, the Iraqi Pro Property Claims Commission process laid out in the towel is good, it's deliberate, it's transparent, and it's impartial. Back here. Shamal Ayyub for CBC. Why does it seem that your troops are so aggressive to Iraqis on the road? Many Iraqis are so afraid of patrols on the road. That's nonsense. The Iraqis uh, up in, 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 uh, in the north central portion of Iraq uh, need to respect the coalition and Iraqi security force convoys. They absolutely need to do that because of the vehicle borne, the suicide vehicle borne IED threat. I think the good people of Iraq understand uh, the, the complexity of this issue. Uh, but to say that we are aggressive on the roads uh, is simply not the case. 
Let, okay. me, let, me, let me go back to the Pentagon and see if there's any, any questions there. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, Tony Capasio with Bloomberg News, sir. Uh, on January 26th, 27th, 28th, what will you be looking for by way of some measures of success to de determine whether your aggressive campaign up the, in the North Central region has somewhat succeeded in managing the insurgency? And second, a numbers question, can you just double on the helicopters how many did you have three weeks ago, and how many do you have today? To give a sense of buildup there for a quick reaction. But let me start with the second question first. I, I'm, I'm not going to give you numbers, but suffice it to say, I've got twice what I had, and it's more than enough. With respect to the measures of effectiveness, uh, this is something that I deal with all the time. How do I know that the soldiers of the Iraqi security forces how do I know that the soldiers of the coalition are being successful? And I think as we get closer to the election, my measure of effectiveness is how well we are doing uh, in deliberate, intelligence-driven combat operations to kill or capture the insurgent. What does that mean in layman's language? I mean, how many you've killed or how many targets you've successfully intercepted based on what you were told earlier? Based on our read of the enemy, based on our analysis as to where the leaders are, where the financers are, uh, where these people are that are building vehicle-borne IEDs, my measure of effectiveness is how many of those we roll up. Been to date in the last month or two. Let me give you some figures. Let me go to the next question, and I'll come back to that. I promise. Uh, uh, General Jim Mannion uh, from Jean France Press. Uh, my, I, I, I was wondering if you could uh, comment a little bit on what it is you see the insurgents doing in anticipation of these elections. How do they appear to be organizing themselves to uh, stop it, disrupt it, uh, and uh, for instance, I think in the area of Tikrit, that was uh, pretty quiet until just fairly recently. So do you see cells moving into some new areas ahead of the elections? Uh, can you describe what you're seeing in that regard? Let me first go back and answer the last question. Since the 1st of October, uh, the Iraqi security forces working with us uh, have killed, we think, about 200 of these insurgents, and we have detained 1,371. I give you those numbers just to give you a, a level of effort, to show you that, that we are aggressively going after the enemy. Uh, we take the fight to the enemy. We don't wait for him to come to us. To, to answer your question, it is true that in Tikrit two days ago there was a a vehicle-borne IED. There hadn't been one in Tikrit for some time, and quite frankly, Tikrit is doing very well uh, as a region, as a city in a region. It's an example where full-spectrum operations properly conducted work very well. Full-spectrum, on the one hand, combat-driven, uh, intel-driven operations to kill or capture, as I've already described, and on the other, stability operations that are designed to change the attitude of the people, that are designed to give the people an alternative to the insurgency. It's all about what are we doing to improve infrastructure, infrastructure and giving these great people a job to give them an alternative to the insurgency. But it is true two days ago there was a vehicle-borne IED that exploded on the southbound lane of Highway 1 about 200 meters away from the provincial police headquarters. Probably Al-Qaeda, if you believe what's in the Internet. I don't know. Uh, very likely. But I expect the insurgency to continue with intimidation in small cells. He is going to intimidate the weak. He's going to go after the lamb. He'll go after the Iraqi security forces in, when he can find them in small numbers because he's beginning to fear the Iraqi security forces. He'll attack us from a distance. General? Uh, this is Brian Whitman. You've been very generous with your time, and we've already exceeded the time that I know you've allocated for this. So I'd just like to uh, thank you on behalf of everybody that's in this room for uh, spending some time with us this morning. 
uh, wish you the best and hope that uh, we can uh, have you back again soon to talk about what the first idea is doing. Uh, thank you, Brian. I should take this opportunity to, to thank you and, and everybody in the Pentagon, but also the American people for the incredible support that they're given the soldiers of, of the Third Corps uh, and, and certainly the 1st Infantry Division Combat Team Task Force Danger. That support's incredible, and it means a lot to our soldiers. Let me see if there's any other questions back here in this, in this audience. Yes. Sir, Jim Garamone with uh, American Forces Press Service. Could you just go uh, into a little more detail on the mentoring program, and is that something that you can export to, say, the other divisions in, uh, in Iraq uh, to, to, uh, so that they could work with the Iraqi security forces the same way? Jim, this is something that certainly, certainly has worked for us. And, it, and as I described, it, it's all about establishing personal relationships. It's personal uh, relationships between battalion commanders, Iraqi and American, uh, battalion executive officers, battalion operations officers, company commanders, first sergeants, platoon leaders, platoon sergeants, right on down the line. Uh, what we have found is that the Iraqi army, no surprise, is just like us. There are so many similarities, and you build on that, and you build that team and that trust. You train hard. Training must be realistic, dynamic, and you need to put soldiers in the same uh, stress that they're going to experience in combat. We found that the typical Iraqi soldier when we got here fired three rounds a year under Saddam's army. That same soldier today is firing 3,000 rounds. He's absolutely qualified as a marksman with his AK-47. That was definitely not true in the past. So it's those kinds of things. One last question. Yes, in the back. Alicia Brewer with Voice of America. I was just wondering, General, um, I was speaking to the Electoral uh, uh, Commission for Iraq the other day, and they said that they will probably will not have election results for at least seven to ten days. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can, if, if you say that violence is going to escalate towards the election, what's going to happen during that period while everybody is waiting for the election? That's a great question, and it will take time for the IECI to, to gather the ballot boxes, count the votes, and come up with an announcement. In, in the Balkans, in, in our experience, that takes some number of days. And we expect the same. It's anybody's guess what the insurgent is going to do during that period of time. Uh, but, but rest assured that the 1st Infantry Division combat team will continue our relentless pressure. We will not let up uh, working with our, our Iraqi security force partners. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank what you do.